welcome all. Uh, this is a great night, in my opinion. It's going to be a wonderful night. Uh, we are hosting today uh, a really, really inspirational and important name, uh, Professor Wendy Brown. Uh, first, I will uh, make an introduction of uh, a Common Horizon uh, project and introduce uh, Professor Brown. Uh, and then she is uh, going to give us uh, a short talk, uh, which will be followed, my, uh, followed by my uh, explorations of her studies and her talk. And then we will pursue with uh, questions and answers. So, the world is passing through an extremely troubled period in its history, with a seemingly new challenge encountered at every turn. Serious economic, social, cultural, environmental, and political crises at a global level are exacerbated by those being felt in individual countries. Only through conscious, patient, and collective effort can we overcome the problems of humanity. Now it is time for dignified people from different cultures and geographies of the world to come together in solidarity. It is time to speak with full respect of human dignity, setting aside the importance we place in our individual identities. The goal of this project is to bring together the leading thinkers of the world to create an international intellectual platform that draws its strength from human dignity and that aims to build for the future of humanity and the planet with a holistic synergy with a view to offering humanity a common horizon. The vision of Cappadocia University is to provide an academic platform from where esteemed intellectuals from around the world can share their visions for a common future for humanity and our planet, and to comment on the challenges and opportunities they envisage. I am Burak Özçetin from Istanbul Bilgi University. I will be hosting today uh, Wendy Brown. Wendy Brown, recognized as one of the most important and original political theorists in the world, is a professor emeritus at UC Berkeley. Professor Brown completed her BA in Economics and Politics at UC Santa Cruz, MA and PhD in Politics in Princeton University. Brown is known with her fresh and critical interventions in critical legal studies and feminist theory. Her research is oriented toward the study of democracy, sovereignty. She is the author of many books, including Manhood and Politics, States of Injury, Critical Essays on Knowledge and Politics, World States Waning Sovereignty, Politics Out of History, Undoing the Demos, and In the Ruins of Neoliberalism, the Rise of Anti-Democratic Politics in the West. Her four books were translated to Turkish, and Professor Brown has published in many academic journals and received several international awards. In The Ruins of Neoliberalism, Brown discusses the basic tenets of neoliberal rationality and governmentality. The titles of the chapters are telling us a lot. According to the neoliberal rationality, society must be dismantled, Politics must be dethroned. The personal protected sphere must be extended. Professor Brown builds up on her thoughts in undoing the demos by criticizing, developing, and updating many of her previous arguments. I believe Professor Brown's dedication to her main problematic, which I consider as defending the political, but through a constant self-critique is inspirational and rare in the intellectual life. I guess this is the reason why Brown does not like speaking on her previous verbs, but looking for forward and the next. One of the most entertaining and intriguing aspects of reading when the Brown is following the footnotes. In this sense, Professor Brown causes a lot of stress and problems since her discussions direct you dozens of exciting ideas and works, contemporary and classics, some of which are new, but some are well-known, but 
provoked to be reconsidered. Originality and freshness of Brown's works come from this openness. Openness to new texts, openness to new questions and new problematics. This was my formal introduction. Now let's have a look at how Wendy is described in the most popular urban dictionary in Turkey, Ekşisözlük. I will make a few quotations from some of the entries. A woman, one of them, the translations are mine by the way, a woman with a pleasant smile creating a heroic mood straight out of Ursula Le Guin's novels. Another one which I liked really much, in her works, she plants, grows and reaps in front of our eyes like a gardener. In another entry, one of the authors have noted, she is indispensable for our university and for our criticism courses. As I have stated, Professor Brown will start with a 20-25 minutes talk on uh, neoliberalism and freedom. Then I will share some of my comments, maybe a slight uh, insignificant contribution to where Brown's works can lead us to or how we might ask new questions. And then we will continue with questions and comments with the audience. I talked already more than enough. Professor Brown, thanks for accepting our invitation and meeting with your enthusiastic audience in Turkey. The floor is yours. Thank you, Barak. It's, a, it's an enormous pleasure to be here for all kinds of reasons. And thank you for that very warm uh, and at times uh, quite funny uh, introduction. Um, I should add one little correction. I currently have a position as um, professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. So though I retired from my position at Berkeley, um, I have a new position, at least for the time being. So using that. <laughs> that's all right. There's no reason to, to apologize. Um, what I uh, will do in the next few minutes is talk in a very um, kind of uh, loose and general way about the project that I'm engaged with now, which is a project that entails thinking about and, and, and considering predicaments of freedom in the 21st century. And in particular, whether freedom is something that the left, the feminist, socialist, ecological left uh, can embrace given those predicaments. So I'll just talk for a few minutes about uh, the, the kind of foundations and compass points of this project, and then be very glad to uh, be in conversation with you, Barak, and also with the audience. Around the world, we are witnessing what may be the most viciously antisocial, irresponsible, and undemocratic understandings and practices of freedom in modern history. Today, Freedom is a contrivance by which already broken political and social orders are further dismembered and degraded. It is the contrivance by which social justice is often demonized as totalitarian, while authoritarian political power is vaunted. It is the contrivance by which racial, gender, and sexual hierarchies are often re-secured through conservative religious annexations of heretofore secular provinces of public and economic life. Freedom is an auspice for flouting public health ordinances, refusing science and fact on disease and climate change, for aggressively ignorant proclamations in ostensibly scholarly environments. And in my own country, it is the auspice for civilians carrying military grade weapons into public spaces. Secular freedom is the auspice through which religious minorities are being persecuted. Religious freedom is the auspice through which women and LGBTQ rights are being curtailed and the rubric for reintroducing Christian prayer in schools in the US 
and eliminating materials on evolutionary science, climate science, and sex education. Above all, freedom today is often deployed to attack what remains of democracy itself. If classical liberalism's stipulation of freedom as a private individual good quietly ignores social powers that bear on its unequal enactment, today, anti-democratic authoritarian liberalism is the political formation that converts freedom into a rabid defense of those very social powers. Divested from popular sovereignty in particular and democratization in general, animated by unprecedented social disintegration generated by neoliberalism, freedom within this form is more than anti-statist. It's anti-democratic, anti-political, anti-social, and at times anti-life. As they want to take your freedom away provides cover for everything from corporate plunder to climate denialism, gun ownership to racist social media screeds to disinformation campaigns. Today's iteration of freedom has been sharpened against a politics of equality, a politics of care, and a politics reckoning with ecological limits. Perhaps this sharpening is an unconscious protest against the incomparably complex and daunting powers of the age. Perhaps it's a revolt against caring for others or the earth when caring for one's own is so challenging. Perhaps it's spirit, freedom against responsibility, society, democracy, inclusion, life, equality, futurity. Perhaps this spirit reflects the death rasp of modern white masculinist supremacy, a regime for which entitlement to exploit and subjugate and plunder has long been wrapped in freedom's flag. Routinized and institutionalized for centuries in practices of empire, colonization, and native land dispossession, today, this entitlement has gone feral. What prospects are there for recuperating freedom for democratic, socialist, ecological, anti-colonial, and feminist politics. These are the large questions animating my work at the moment. To get at them, however, we must depart a contemporary common sense in which the right is imagined to have recently stolen and resignified the left's treasure. Far more than mobilization by the hard right is responsible for left disorientation about political freedom today. So I want to begin here with Western freedom's troubling legacies. Freedom has never not been weaponized. Its hegemonic form in the West has always been saturated with the right to dominate and exploit. Indeed, while affirming liberation movements challenging empire and colonialism, slavery and patriarchy, critical intellectuals in recent decades have also charted in detail the ways that freedom has hoisted and legitimated white male supremacy, colonial dispossession, and entitlements of wealth. While freedom widely signifies release from bondage in popular parlance, its iteration and practice in the West has been essential to securing and extending white masculine colonial and imperial entitlement and essential to resisting challenges to this entitlement. White nationalists, religious patriarchalists and ordinary capitalists draw on this legacy today as they rebuke every law of pro property regulation, equality and social justice reform as a totalitarian infringement of their freedom. Orlando Patterson's landmark study on freedom makes clear that freedom emerged from the cradle of Western civilization in ancient Greece only because we find slavery there as well. It was slavery that secured ancient freedom and gave it its shape. Freedom as a gendered and civilizational discourse of political theory is as old as Aristotle's ontological distinction between free propertied men on the one hand and those by nature designed to be ruled on the other, women, slaves, workers. Modern liberalism contained its own version of the ontology. In On Liberty, John Stuart Mill's great encomium to individuality realized through liberty, 
he front loads a hard distinction between the civilized European and the barbaric rest of the world in which the former is not merely entitled but morally obliged to govern and improve the latter. Not only today then has freedom termed murderous, supremacist, militarist, or imperial, and not only today has freedom as right of capital, property, nations, or speech, empires, men, or slave holders, served inequality and its violences. Since their birth, Western ideals of freedom have gifted their beauty and power to the dominant and to the cause of retaining that dominance. This is one major legacy of freedom that we need to grasp and transform. Freedom has always been Janus faced, both the brass ring and the knee on the neck for the wretched of the earth. Can it be otherwise? If today's variant licenses especially unsheathed and widespread expressions of entitlement and viciousness, this may index not only a state of emergency for the supremacism it codifies, but the unprecedented disembedding of freedom from social responsibility and from the promise of shared rule in democracy. In previous work, I've considered the twinning of these two, but I want to turn now to two other troubling legacies of Western freedom. First, it's tearing apart of political, social, and individual freedom. And second, it's misbegotten relation to the order it designates, tellingly and troublingly, as nature or the environment. Two kinds of power in particular constitute what we might call freedom's scene. First, we alone among the creatures construct, inherit, and inhabit relations and orders of power that escape our control despite being our own creation. This, of course, is Marx, Weber, Foucault, Fanon 101. These orders of power, often but not always invisible and unnamed, inevitably complex, traverse psychic, social, economic, cultural, and political registers. We alone among the creatures engender our own domination through the interdependent stratification and subjectification that these orders and relations entail, not only through exercise of physical strength or command or control of resources. We alone struggle to craft individual and collective lives amidst orders of power that we generate and reproduce, but which slip our grasp. Today, this includes powers entailed in modes of production, exchange and consumption, finance and technology, culture and religion, and subject constitution at the site of race, gender, sexuality, caste and ethnicity. Neither natural nor divine, emanating from yet exceeding human intention, stewardship or consent. These orders of power generate hierarchies, exclusions, subjectivities and suffering as well as conduct, potentials, and communities. The more sophisticated and complex, the more global and invasive these powers become, the greater freedom's challenges. This singular species generativity, this potential for collective subjugation through it is one part of freedom's scene, one ignored by the figure of freedom that liberalism provides. Indeed, freedom conceived as an individual holding and exercised as personal choice elides these world-making powers through which humans are shaped, burdened, and constrained. This elision performed by liberalism and constituting modern liberal and especially neoliberal formulations of freedom radically narrow freedom's meaning and reach. As it locates liberty in the individual, and identifies it with non-interference, whether from others or from the state. Liberalism unleashes us amidst powers we do not control or understand or often name, powers that stratify, subject, and now existentially threaten us. Blending liberalism with democracy or republicanism does not alter this. When freedom is framed only as the absence of literal interdiction, whether interdiction by a master, a tyrant, law, state, or the police, or a censor, it ignores this feature of freedom seen. 
As the powers organizing existence multiply and ramify, the prospect of controlling or replacing them recedes, which is surely why the remark generally attributed to Frederick Jameson that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism struck such a chord. Again, liberalism, far from providing means to corral and handle these powers together, facilitates our surrender to them. Neoliberalism completes this surrender with its open preference for market rule rather than human rule. Limiting a constricted horizon of human possibility for self-governing, liberalism offers the solace of withdrawal and non-responsibility for the world that we make and inhabit together. And of course, the birth of this creed for withdrawal and non-responsibility coincided with the Industrial Revolution's intense acceleration of the Anthropocene, about which more in a moment. The second order of power constructing the scene of freedom, the first was our generation of social powers, the second one pertains to the domain we generally designate as political. As animals who neither roam solo nor herd together instinctively, humans are everywhere and always organized in part through arrangements of rule. In contrast with the Marx, Weber, Foucault, Fanon analytics of power that developed the first problematic, the second one in the Western tradition is associated with figures like Aristotle, Rousseau, and Tocqueville. It's on this basis it's, it is the basis on which democracy, the aspiration to rule ourselves together so we're not ruled by others or apart, belongs to us humans alone among the animals. Powers of rule, whether concentrated or distributed, institutionalized or informal, differ in kind from our unique capacity to generate the social powers I just discussed. Powers of rule cannot be fully reduced to social powers, even as they may also emanate from, blend with, consecrate, enforce, regulate, or alter those social powers. Powers of rule, in their infinitely varied styles and forms, are the second order of power constituting freedom's scene. Rarely are these two realms of power considered together in theorizing or practicing freedom. The Marxist tradition teaching us so much about the first problematic is unhelpful with the second. Marx was too seduced by his own critique of the state, too eager to subvert the Hegelian preoccupation with it, too eager to reveal what he identified initially as civil society and then as the capitalist mode of production, as exhaustive of, of unemancipated existence. To permit the complexities of political power and political rule a place in the ontics of communist freedom. Yet political powers required for handling public ownership never disappear. And they are enormously difficult to democratize as every existing socialist state has revealed. On the other hand, the political theory tradition concerned with just rule and especially with political freedom exercised through shared rule has routinely neglected the orders of social power constituting freedom's first problematic. This is true across the Aristotelian, Rousseauian, Tocquevillian, and Neo-Kantian traditions that dominate democratic theory today. Democratic socialist thinking is no exception, tending as it does to identify freedom with the adjective democratic and equality with the noun socialism, and often reducing freedom to its liberal iteration. To compress the point, if the problematic of freedom arises both from the challenges of mastering and directing the multiple forms of social power that humans generate, and from the challenges of organizing political power itself as political freedom, political theory has tended to locate emancipation at the site of the former and democracy at the site of the latter. The consequence, theoretically and practically, has been unemancipated democracy or undemocratized emancipation. This divide is mirrored in contemporary discourse and punditry, where crises of liberal democracy, focused on corruptions of democratic institutions, 
are generally analyzed apart from social movements concerned with work or poverty, sexism, racism, homo or transphobia, migration, policing, religion, incarceration, and more. And liberalism, of course, goes further by detaching freedom from both emancipation and democracy, rendering it instead as the protection of individuals against intrusions of political or personal power. Okay, where are we? Thus far, I've identified two problematic legacies of Western freedom. There is first, its predication on the vast unfreedom of the many and license to dominate and exploit this population, women, slaves, serfs, natives, etc. And there is second, the separation of emancipation, revolutionized social power from democratization, collective determination through shared rule. Both of these legacies are sites of crisis today. The first in the struggle over racial, gendered, and ecological politics, over whether these shall remain sites of hierarchy, exploitation, and violence, or be repaired from this history. The second is a site of crisis today in struggles over the very future of capitalism and liberal democracies. Now I want to turn to a third troubling legacy of Western freedom, which is also a site of crisis in our time. This concerns the consequential anthropocentrism and linking of freedom to forms of sovereignty, individual, collective, and state, that together yield the destructiveness of what we call the great acceleration of the Anthropocene, threatening so many life forms, including our own. The relevance of the Anthropocene to freedom exceeds the matter of limits required for self-preservation. And it exceeds the question of capitalist rights to private ownership and profiteering. Rather, the climate crisis and other ecological tipping points epitomize our collective subjection at the hands of our collective generativity, our failure historically to govern or control the systematic powers we generate. Mirroring both our enormous capacities to generate those powers and our felt impotence before them. Anthropocentric effects also indict all formulations of freedom that are abstracted from effects on the non-human, which, non, which is all canonical forms of freedom, not just those explicitly linked to what for centuries has been symptomatically deemed mastery of nature. Why symptomatic? As Depeche Chakrabarti, Bruno Latour, and Amitav Ghosh remind us, the modern Western, Western discursive distinction between culture and nature, far from timeless or merely descriptive, involves an objectification and reification of both culture and nature that results in delusional thinking about and severe damage to peoples and planet. The nature-culture opposition undergirds the murder-suicide of the anthropocentric climate and biodiversity crises. It's also part of the legitimating gloss of Western imperialism and colonialism. On the one hand, reification of nature is entailed in conceits of entitlement to exploit it or mandates to master it. On the other, every constellation of supremacy in the modern West, whiteness, maleness, Europeanness, is identified with the culture side of the distinction and posits as its other the posits its other as either more proximate to or directly identified with nature darkness femaleness africanness nativeness indigenousness and so forth as edward said and countless others have taught the nature culture binary both constitutes the white male European figure at the heart of Western humanism and licenses its exploitation and plunder of its hypostasized others. The nature culture binary, technically false, is productive, dangerously so, as a governing practical truth. It founds the knowledges and legitimation of colonial and imperial Euro-Atlantic modernity and the destruction of the earthly life that sustains all life. This problem exceeds the issue of who is assigned where in the culture-nature divide. It reaches to the divide and the categories themselves, 
which tether an ensemble of delusions and exploits bound to them. For Amitav Ghosh, the historical phenomenon in which the greatest accelerant of the Anthropocene, European industrialization, was co-terminus with Euro-Atlantic imperial and colonial domination, reminds us that the climate events of our own era are, as he puts it, distillations of all human history, expressing the entirety of our being over time. These events also reveal, and I'm quoting him again, the universalist premise of industrial civilization was a hoax. That a consumerist mode of existence, if adopted by a sufficient number of people, would quickly become unsustainable and lead literally to the devouring of the planet. In other words, bourgeois Western ways of life could never be shared with the multitudes without, as Gandhi put it, as early as 1928, stripping the world bare like locusts. This hoax of universal comfort through high levels of consumption is precisely what makes neoliberal governance and metrics, not just its deregulation of capital, so grotesquely untimely. This governance, these metrics, were extended across a planet already facing climate and biodiversity tipping points behind neoliberal measures of success in developing countries, rising growth rates combined with declining Gini coefficients, in short, more and more and more consumption. Behind these measures of success are devastating spikes in fossil fuel consumption and emissions, forest clear cutting, water extraction, habitat destruction, and other practices threatening the remains of a habitable earth. Empire then, the exploitation of vast regions and populations for a small few, and not only capitalism, is inextricably entwined with our great ecological crisis today. What does this mean for freedom? Certainly the ecological crisis confronts us with the existential, not just ethical or moral requirements of placing at freedom's heart an appreciation of all forms of connected life, as well as comprehensive responsibility for all effects of human action. There is no theory and no practice of freedom in the history of the West that features these. But the inextricability of empire and the great acceleration of the Anthropocene directly connects this problematic of freedom with the other two that I've already raised. It links freedom's historical imbrication with colonial, imperial, and other practices of white male supremacy with freedom's anthropomorphic conceits, thus connecting two different kinds of bad humanism. And it challenges us to develop a freedom that is responsive to interconnected life and responsible for human effects across the registers of political and social power. These challenges are complex and highly at risk for being misunderstood. They're not about allowing the so-called agency of things to dethrone freedom or its distinctively human character. They're not about living in harmony with nature as if untouched nature still existed, and as if static harmony rather than transformations, appropriations, discord, difference, death, and violence occurs in this misnamed, misnamed domain. And they are not about consciousness raising or idealist responses to a set of historical materialist predicaments. Rather, these challenges require revised formulations and practices of agency, humanness, and the interconnectedness of life. They depend on critique and transformation of the ontologies and cosmologies, not to mention theologies comprising the Western history of freedom. These revisions are spurred today by the crises to which I've been alluding. Crises manifest around the world, if everywhere differently. We might call these crises of equality, democracy, and eco-viability, along with a crisis of freedom itself. And of course, it's this last crisis with which I began, registering freedom's contemporary mobilization, not for the flourishing of individual societies or polities, but for rancorous attacks on each, whether by defending supremacy against equality or dismantling liberal democracy or ensuring the unlimited right to planetary plunder. 
Here I will not reprise in detail, but only list the constellation of forces that generates this recent iteration of freedom, which I am terming freedom's crisis. There is, of course, the neoliberal disembedding of freedom, more than merely decoupled from democracy and society. Within neoliberal reason, freedom is discursively opposed to democracy and the very idea of society. Anti-egalitarian and anti-statist in rationale, neoliberal freedom thus wars against social justice, refuses democratic accountability, and is so deeply privatized that it is wholly compatible with political autocracy or authoritarianism. Hence the contemporary possibility of autocratic liberalisms. There is also the rancor against effects of globalized capital, its deracinations and destabilizations of so many millions. These effects equally, e easily and frequently displaced onto other agents, especially migrants, religious minorities, but also feminists, progressives, even democracy itself, create an angry xenophobic populism as one of globalization's offspring. Related, there is the corrosive effect of globalized powers on state and subject sovereignty. This generates an anxiety, violence-filled interregnum between Westphalianism and whatever its successor will be. It makes attractive psychic, social, and literal border fortifications from xenophobic hatreds to concrete walls. And there are nihilistic depressions of conscience and care that desublimate and disinhibit all of these fears, humiliations, frustrations, and wounds, bleeding them directly and angrily into the social and political sphere where they create a toxic brew with all the other effects I have just listed. This is how nihilism's desublimated will to power intersects re neoliberal reason and neoliberal socioeconomic effects to generate the antisocial anti-democratic expressions of freedom that we considered at the beginning of my remarks. The long history of Western freedom as a white male entitlement is the framework. Neoliberal attacks on democracy, social justice, and state regulation are the legitimating force. Global powers corroding the sovereignty, security, and stability it promised are the kindling. Nihilistic desublimation and disinhibition, and perhaps semi-conscious awareness of living in end times are the fuel. What to do with this freedom that has gone fully rogue, that has been torn from context through which it could support rather than destroy prospects of justice, eco-viability, and peaceful cohabitation, in which the alchemy of neoliberalism, globalization, white male supremacy, nihilism, and climate crisis denialism have made freedom monstrous when its ancient right of protecting orders of dominance and exploitation are on full and open display, when it has become wholly detached from what I have been calling freedom seen, endeavoring to control and rule together the powers that we generate and that otherwise control and rule us. I've been suggesting that we grasp this condition as a crisis of freedom, one that articulates with other crises of our time, those of democracy, post-colonial global justice, political economy, a habitable planet. And I believe that at what is often named left-right polarization in many regions of the world today ought to be read as a manifestation of these crises rather than itself the crisis. I also share the view that crises, however terrifying at these magnitudes, are spaces and times from which new possibilities emerge, and above all, when ideas matter. If received practices of freedom are part of what have brought about these crises and are also themselves in crisis, what kinds of freedom could replace them? What might the place of freedom be in elaborating visions and values that articulate with political, economic, and social coordinates for a more sustainable and just future? What is freedom's part in redeeming the promise that humans might control the complex powers that we generate and not simply make a grievous 
frightening mess from our distinctive species capacities. How might freedom be remade apart from imbrication with supremacy, domination, exploitation? What kind of human freedom for a healthy planet? These are my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. It, it, it was really, really good. And it reminded me the uh, parts uh, on in the ruins of neoliberalism and your uh, article, uh, persons becoming firms and firms becoming persons, you know, where we see that the companies, the firms and their freedoms are important now and they have the freedom to manipulate the public. Uh, they have the freedom to uh, reject serving their customers. You know, they were, when freedom uh, is considered, now it's the uh, freedom of the companies, the firms, uh, and so. This was uh, an amazing talk. Uh, I, I'm sure that there will be a lot uh, of questions and comments that will follow up. Uh, th th there are a lot of uh, points and there are a lot of, you know, uh, major points, some minor points that must be discussed. Uh, maybe we will have some time on nihilism debate, which I see really, really important. You know, resentment, uh, spite, and nihilism and their place in uh, politics, uh, which I do see as a, a communication plus political science scholar. I do see your work, your contributions really, really important for uh, our uh, understandings of politics and political communication. So uh, having the risk of boring you, uh, now I'm going to make uh, some comments and uh, I, I hope that the audience will forgive me uh, uh, for a bit stealing the stage uh, from you. Uh, I would like to start, uh, th th that something came up to my mind today. Uh, I, I, I did not prepare this uh, weeks ago, but while I was reading your works, it, uh, it made me to reconsider my position as, a, as an academic, as an intellectual. For many years, I'm, uh, I, I've been reading your works and it's always been inspirational. I would like to start with uh, an autoethnographic, we may say, account of being an academic and a citizen uh, in Turkey. Uh, and I do believe that many of the themes uh, that I'm going to bring up are too much related with your account of neoliberalism, your account of freedom and democracy. Uh, this is not a tragedy. This is not an emotional cry for help or call for anyone's conscience but a self-reflexive exploration and presentation of the political and intellectual environment within which I'm trying to survive, think, and create as an academic. Let's begin. I'm an academic, a full professor in a foundation slash private university in Turkey. I do see myself in a privileged position when I compare myself with my colleagues who are in or off Turkish universities. I'm an academic with a Google Scholar account, setting Google alerts, warning and celebrating me when I'm cited. I have age index. I care about my age index a lot. But if you ask me, I have no idea about what an age index is or how it is measured or calculated. I also have other indexes and profiles like I-10, a Pablon profile, Google Academic Account, a ResearchGate account, a LinkedIn, LinkedIn account, which I believe uh, a network, a social network where neoliberal subjectivity and lunacy is in its peak. I see universities in Turkey with their slogans, adapt the change. Those are true slogans. Another one tempts to pro tempts prospective students with the slogan, we are the enterprise of your life. University is considered as an enterprise, calling for adapting the change, not changing the world or making it a better place. I remember Professor Brown's, your comments on universities and education. This is from the ruins. Quote, higher education is not only reconfigured by neoliberal rationality as an investment by human capital in the enhancement of its own future value, 
this transformation makes literally unintelligible the idea and practice of education as a democratic public good. Yes, I am an academic. I'm a part of this lunacy. I have a Twitter account which I use for academic purposes and update it regularly and have plenty of followers. I feel happy and satisfied with more interaction, followers and attention. Yes, I am a part of this lunacy. I am an academic obsessed with publishing in high impact factor journals and obsessed with abbreviations like SSCR, AHCR, EHCR, SCI, and on. Who cares with what I say or who says what? The name of the journal, the name of the index, wait, the Q rate is what is important. Is it Q1? Good to go. I'm an academic after funds, after projects, not having much time to think, read, for a nice holiday, losing myself in literature, poetry, or long walks. I'm an academic who is day by day forgetting what thinking was like. I'm trying to learn the formulas and tricks of writing excellent grant proposals and academic articles. Social media and blogs are full of suggestions by overachievers. How to make best of yourself. Which, you know, brings us to undoing the demos, undoing the demos. I start seeing my courses and students as obstacles in my way. I'm becoming more professional, more alone, more project-wise as I walk away from thinking. My dear colleague, Grant Dicken, in the very first page of his book, Nihilism, wrote, yes, thinking is friendship. And for me, forgetting to think is to walk away from friendship. I'm an academic, I'm losing my friends, underestimating the importance of the meaningful world together. I'm an academic, but I'm also an academic in Turkey. In addition to waves of neoliberalism, I feel threatened by the increasing authoritarianization of my country and feel the pain and shame of hundreds of academics, many of whom are my friends who lost their jobs for expressing their ideas. So I'm an academic, like every other individual, full of contradictions, fears, and hopes. So how did I, the world, Turkey, and the universities come to this point? I do believe, as I stated, your contribution means a lot, in my opinion, for study of communication, study of political communication. And this is what I'm going to try to do in the following few minutes. It will not take so long. Three dynamics of contemporary political systems that feed anti-democratic and populist political projects are the crisis of the structures of political representation and intermediation, increased personalization of political power, and mediatization of political life and political communication. I believe that the third point, the debate over mediatization would make a meaningful contribution to our understanding of neoliberalism and neoliberal rationality. Audience democracy is the term coined by Bernard Manin to explain the current phase of Western liberal democracies. Increased voter volatility, de-alignment, replacement of ideological and political cleavages, cleavages with cultural ones, the increased media presence in politics are the defining characteristics of audience democracy. With respect to the latest trait, Manon highlights the increased importance of media specialists, polling experts, and journalists. In audience democracy, people tend to vote for a person and no longer for a party or program, and people follow the spectacle, not the politics or the political. In audience democracies, politics is increasingly aestheticized, rationalized, and mediatized. Politicians and citizens increase preoccupation with stylishness. Image and representation has turned politics into a spectacle. Rationalization of politics and political communication increased the role of experts and expert knowledge in politics and election processes. Political consultant Raymond Strother bluntly observed, in political consultancy, winning is everything. 
there is no good second place, no runner-up award. As a result, no cost is too great. Survival depends on it. End of quote. In complex media environment, where media management, big data processing, and computational propaganda are of extreme importance, the political void, which is so dangerous and which you describe perfectly in your works, Professor Brown, is filled with consultants and professionals. Powerful and political actors are, with the guidance of these expert knowledge, using computational propaganda techniques to perpetrate political attacks to spread disinformation, censor and attack journalists and create fake trends. Political marketing, niche marketing, targeted marketing, these are, in my opinion, the most annoying terms that dominate contemporary political communication lexicon. The common denominator of these terms is the idea of electorate as a customer or consumer, but not a citizen. Centrality and abundance of media have changed the way politics and political communication were performed. Mediatization is a really, really fruitful term to conceptualize the place of media in contemporary societies. It is not only about the importance of media but refers to a social process in which media have become increasingly influential and deeply integrated into different spheres of society. In this new environment, media emancipates itself strongly from the political actors and impose its logic, formats, content, grammar, and rhythm about, uh, upon them. Mediatization of politics have provided populist authoritarian political actors and their constituencies with a fruitful communication environment to produce and disseminate their hateful and resentful discourses. People today are not only nihilists or sadists, but they have now every opportunity to express their nihilism, resentment and sadism in and through the media through the social media. In the ruins, Professor Brown states, the wreckage that nihilism makes of conscience may also help explain the unprecedented aggression and viciousness emanating from right-wing cable and internet news, blogs, and tweets. This aggression and viciousness is fed by neoliberal valorization of liberation, libertarian freedom, by wounded, angry white maleness, and by nihilism's radical depression of conscious and social publication, end of quote. In this new information environment, political journalism was undermined with increased market orientation. Hard news and political serious content were replaced by competition over sensational, easily digestible political content, which attract the attention of the audience. The situation was further exacerbated by the dominance of infotainment approach to politics, which denotes the entangling of political actors, topics, and processes with the entertainment culture. The media now promotes a new cultural law, which is in line with the anti-elitist discourse of populism, which tempers the tastes, values, resentments, and spite of the ordinary citizen. Arguing for an elective affinity between post-truth politics and populism, Raysborg notes that the upsurge of populist politics is symptomatic of the consolidation of post-truth communication as a distinctive feature of contemporary politics. Accordingly, populism's Manichaean politics is antithetic to truth-telling and populists are mostly against facts and truths produced by knowledge-producing elites such as scientists and experts. Communication strategies of authoritarian populist leaders and movements include playing the role of the underdog, use of professional expertise, rallies, free media publicity, staging events, and tactical attacks on the media. In polarized political environments where partisanship is a distinctive trait of media outlets, the media is skillfully used by populist leaders and movements. They use the media for mobilizing the electorate, setting the agenda, 
and closing the ranks and media willingly or unwillingly, consciously or unconsciously take their part in the process. This is why I do believe that your works on neoliberal uh, rationality, uh, neoliberalism, freedom, democracy, uh, your insistence on defending the political uh, and uh, public good is so essential, so important for uh, a democratic emancipatory, both dem democratic and emancipatory uh, social political world and media politics. These are my reflections on what I uh, take from you, what I, in quotation, learn from you, what you, the openness of your text uh, brought me. Uh, and would like to ask you my first question. Uh, are you thinking of going more on the role of the media, the role of the social media, analyzing it in a deeper way and share all your thoughts about the subject? Uh, the quick answer is no, because people like you are doing it and um, should be doing it. And there are two reasons why I'm not. Um, one is just a woeful lack of knowledge. Uh, and the second is a woeful lack of contact. I do everything I can to avoid social media. Um, and that's not a, a virtuous or principled position. It's a visceral and emotional one. Um, it's not that I uh, think I'm superior to those who spend their days in and on and through uh, social media. I don't. Um, it's partly probably generational. Um, but I think it's more than that. I, I think uh, there's more than a little bit of a Luddite in me. And I, um, I, I was um, late coming even to uh, use of a computer, um, iPhone, the rest of it, and certainly um, have never been on a, uh, I've never owned or had, I don't know that we own them, a Twitter account, a Facebook account, a TikTok account, or anything else. So um, I completely accept what you're saying about the intersection of mediatization and neoliberalism and mediatization and de-democratization. I follow the work of people like you and others who are teaching us uh, what, the, what I want to suggest is a contingent intersection between the rise of neoliberalism and the digital revolution, what that intersection has generated uh, such that the um, privatization of public institutions could be so gratifying. I mean, if you imagine the privatization of public institutions and the privatization of everyday life in the absence of social media, it would be a very lonely experience. It would be extremely lonely and extremely precarious. Mm -hmm. But what digitization, what the digital revolution, not just social media, but it, but, but more, more generally access uh, to a connected world through the digital universe has produced uh, is, is, a, is a safety net for that loneliness, isolation, fragmentation, and so forth, and a different order of connectedness than that which was formerly held or, or, or organized by public life, public spheres, uh, civic centers, public squares, uh, the agora, and so forth. So uh, we have a, a contingent conversion here between uh, the rise of neoliberalism and the digital revolution. And we have a contingent conversion between the de-democratization that neoliberal rationality generates and um, that which is aided and abetted by the order of, as you describe it, uh, politics as spectacle, an expert class for um, producing, massaging, and managing the consumer class, formerly the citizens. Um, we, we have a, a, a contingent set of convergences here that need to be examined in exactly the way that you are, but it's not my bailiwick. It's only mine to learn from. Um, I just wanna say one other thing about your remarks and then we can go to your questions. Um, 
One is I was very struck by the honesty in your opening about your own personal satisfaction in um, the metrics and the ranking and the entrepreneurial um, successes of being a neoliberalized academic. And I, I think that honesty is really important because I think we too often um, as critics uh, treat, how do I want to put it? We, we, we treat that phenomenon of living in the world of followers and rankings and age factors and all the rest of it as a world that we either have been commanded into against our will mm -hmm. or that we're addicted to against our will uh, or that others participate in, but we don't participate in. And what you did so beautifully, I think, in your opening was um, describe what only a few other people in their work I think have done, which is the deep emotional social satisfactions that neoliberalization generates, even if it also generates dis-ease, unease, and consciousness of a wrecked world. I mean, mm -hmm. we may be fully conscious that as you put it at one point, you barely have time to think, to read, you've come to be less and less um, a teacher who treats teaching as an important part of your life because it's a distraction from and a, and, a, and a deportation of your chance to keep climbing these various ladders. But I think that the, the recognition, not just of the dopamine hits, but the deep subjective satisfactions that neoliberalized subjects take, even if they have a left analysis, is, is, is a really important place to begin uh, our work. And so I'm grateful to you for that. Mm -hmm. The quarrel I have is with your treatment of nihilism as an attitude. I've been working for some time and the book I have coming out soon um, on, on politics and knowledge in, in the age of nihilism. It's a kind of meditation on, on Max Weber actually. Um, that, that in that book and in, in the ruins of neoliberalism, I've tried to argue strenuously with Nietzsche, with Weber, with Tolstoy, that, that nihilism needs to be understood as a condition, not merely an attitude, and therefore one that we are all in, left to right, that there's no escaping it, and that it has exactly, not so much to do with um, fatalism or hopelessness or belief that nothing matters as it does with um, a, a condition of uh, trivialization and instrumentalization mm -hmm. of uh, values, people, persons, um, uh, uh, life itself. And, um, you know, this is what Nietzsche teaches us in, in, in describing nihilization, nihilism as a devaluation of values, but not um, an elimination of values. And when values are devalued, when they're when they're unmoored from 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 divine or other foundational sources, um, that's when they become fungible, trivial, saleable, and so forth. And that's of course what we see as ubiquitous in politics and and commercial life today. But also that we're all caught up in, and that you described in a way as a, as a self-account in the very beginning of your remarks. Sure, okay, thank you. So we have really good questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I, I want to give the stage to uh, our, our participants. Uh, the first question is from Bülent, uh, my friend Bülent Özçelik. Uh, he, that he's shortly asking that in, uh, in the ruins that are caused by neoliberalism uh, destroyed uh, the society and uh, or aimed to destroy the society togetherness and the public uh, so uh, an exit from this point needs new rational publicities and collectivism 
how can these be built or where are we going to look for those publics? How are, how are we going to reconstruct those publics? Uh, asks uh, to that. Great. Well, I think that we actually see lots of evidence of, of construction of publics today, both right and left. Um, uh, and we see them in, in political mobilizations and social movements. Um, to some degree, we may say these are uh, reconstructions of publics that are precisely arising out of the, the ruins of neoliberalism because they're very rarely uh, the kinds of publics that uh, liberal democracy, secular liberal democracy imagined. Um, they are on the left, much more um, insurgent movements. They may travel under the sign of sociocracy or anarchy. They may travel under the sign of the commons. Um, but they are not organized very often as um, conventionally mainstream political publics uh, standing for or attempting to represent uh, the, the, the whole of society. Um, and on the right, of course, what one sees is a, is a wholesale attack on uh, democratic forms of publics. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in favor of um, publics that uh, we might say uh, certainly aim to mobilize the state in order to secure what I would suggest are forms of, of, of uh, mm, almost anti-public sociality, whether it's rooted in family or uh, narrowly circumscribed communities, ethno-nationalisms, and so forth. So I don't think it's for me to say, oh, here's the new ground for yeah. constituting publics, because that's, that's, a, that's a leaping over of the, of the relations in which we find ourselves now. But rather our question is, what do we see? And for me, the question especially is, what do we see on the left as emerging forms of publics that we can in turn, um, how shall I put it, in, in, encourage, shape, incite to be more oriented toward a diverse commons and less oriented toward um, what we call in the U.S. bubbles, or uh, or yeah, yeah. Um, you know narrow groups of like-minded peoples, because publics, if if we are to have democratized publics, must understand themselves as featuring diversity and dissension. They must they must have a quality of 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 sharing space and argument and um, the building of a future with those who aren't necessarily like oneself uh, in, in any way, socially, politically, uh, economically, and so forth. And I, I think that's really important to remember in building from the kinds of publics that we already see emerging in left, um, social movements and political mobilization. So let me make this more concrete by just saying, I'm not convinced that solidarity is the language that helps us with this project. Because solidarity almost always has to do with looking for those with whom one wants to make a common world against those one does not want to be making a common world. And, and, and there's a place for solidarity. But it is not, it, it's, it's, a, it's a social, emotional uh, form of, of support and connection that I think is extremely important, but it is not by any means the same as building publics. I'll stop there. Really? Yeah, that's great. You know, so uh, that, that, that reminded me the great contribution by Nancy Fraser on creation of counterpublics or existence of counterpublics, not the ghettos, you know, maybe uh, publics, but not ghettos. Uh, another question is coming from uh, Idil Atabinen. Uh, I'm quoting 
Uh, Brown's suggestion to deconstruct freedom is like an erasure, erasure of all political theory which argues for a freedom that is bound to regularity. And this argument is what is hopeful for us who are dying to see a way out. It is like water in desert to believe that freedom can only born out of constriction. Based on this, how does Brown argue for emancipating action under this domination that is so well built that it only permits for action within tiny cracks? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, if you understood it clearly, Brock, would you mind? Uh, this is uh, written directly in uh, English, but as far as you know, uh, I understand it is uh, more concerned with uh, emancipating action, uh, the how of emancipating action under such circumstances of unfreedom, I guess, as far as I understand. Where will be because under this domination, which is so well built that only permits for action within tiny cracks. I where, see, I see. I where see. we will search for emancipating action. Okay. Um, yeah, it's an important question. So so if if I do understand it now, it's a question of wh where is there really the possibility of freedom if, if, if we are uh, living today in... Um, wherever we are living, uh, regardless of the, de the degree of repressive political rule, if we're living in orders of social domination that are so extreme that um, the possibility for action is, is quite constrained. Um, I, 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 I think the question is still participating to some degree in a formulation of freedom that I'm trying to call into question. Mm -hmm. which is a formulation of freedom that understands freedom as a matter of, of um, throwing off constraints or as, as action in relationship to um, um, a no or a negation. And I, I'm, I'm trying to get us to think about freedom in, in a somewhat different register, which is in relationship to um, the first of all, the problematic legacies of freedom that 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 I've called for for you know sort of rethinking and uh, escaping. But secondly, the question for me of freedom is not so much one of of, of individual action uh, as it is for what kind of freedom the left could stand for at this point if our historical predicates of freedom are so bound up with anthropocentric damages, elision of uh, the problem of rule in, in, in socialist organization, and elision of the problem of social domination in democratic traditions. So in some ways, though, the question is an important question. It's, it, it's not my question. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, another a, a, a bit long uh, question, so I, 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 I'm trying to uh, at the same time edit it. The questions are coming to uh, to me through WhatsApp uh, in English, and I'm editing them uh, to uh, make it more comprehensible. Uh, in uh, the question is, uh, and let me tell you, this is from uh, Dr. Sinan Akıllı from uh, Kapadokya University. Uh, in an article, uh, physicist Alan Cotty reminded us, reminded us how, when it comes to addressing climate and sorry for it, I lost. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in an article, physicist Alan Cotty reminded us how, when it comes to addressing climate and ecological emergencies, quoting. The path is long between primary research and the daily concerns of hard-to-reach people, those who are impoverished, end of quote. Uh, his, it is enough that expert scientists express their findings accurately and intelligibly to all who are receptive. His discussion leaves the job of disseminating the scientific findings among the public 
to intellectuals of all kinds, journalists, politicians, business people, and concerned citizens. How would you comment on this position? Do you think that scientific discourse should also change to guarantee more freedom of knowledge? Thank you. Um, do you think the question is, if, if there is a gap between climate science and what most of us in, a, in an everyday way can actually understand, if, if that's part of the point, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and therefore there has to be a, 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 a mediation mm -hmm. um, by journalists, by professors, by, by especially by, by really good science writers, those people who explain science to the world, um, that, that I, I'm trying to figure out where freedom comes into this. That's, that's what I'm trying to understand mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. question. It seems, um, it seems like the end of the question wanted us to talk about uh, sh should there be more or less free academic freedom for scientists? Mm -hmm. Do you think that's what the question is? Uh, freedom of knowledge. Uh, I, I'm waiting. Maybe there will be some uh, clarifications from uh, Dr. Sinan uh, Akıllı. Maybe we can move to another one. Maybe there will be a clarification. Since, okay. uh, I mean, since... The only thing I would say here, in case there isn't, is this. Uh, you know, it's very, very difficult to imagine bringing all the science of climate change to all of us. It's, it's, it's I mean, you know, a lot of it's dense and complex. On the other hand, it's very easy to explain some of the most basic processes that are transforming the climate and the biodiversity of the earth and to explain what it means to reduce carbon emissions, reduce production and consumption and reduce extractivism in order to slow, if not stop that process. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm struck here by an analogy you know, Marx wrote three volumes on capital. And it's a dense three volumes. Very, very, very few people on the left have read those three volumes. But you can also take what Marx discovered in those three volumes, the part that remain the parts that remain relevant about capitalism's dependence on growth, dependence mm -hmm. on labor exploitation, dependence on constant production of new sources of labor, cheapening labor and new markets, and put that in two pages. It is possible for that to be compressed, not, not um, made vulgar, but simplified and explained without all of the science. And I, I think we need to um, grasp that part of the reason that understanding climate change is difficult is not because of the science, but because we don't want to. It's a terrifying condition and a terrifying problem of magnitude. And the refusal to understand climate change is probably far more important than the difficulty. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, a question from Özgür Nurt uh, is uh, coming. That this is a political question. And this uh, question is also so important for me when I'm uh, reading uh, you and your contributions. Uh, I always have uh, this uh, in my mind. Let me get it. Yes. Uh, in your works, you are uh, stressing uh, the critique of neoliberalism. And you are mostly engaging with the last 40 years of capitalism in some uh, parts it is passing like that. So, uh, in, and in this critique, you mostly focus on, you know, authoritarian, right-wing, populist, and anti-democratic cases of neoliberalism. But I agree to Özgür, in some cases, maybe this can be considered as a critique, the, uh, you know, uh, 
the more beautiful phase of neoliberalism, you know, the East Coast liberal, the more, li you know, more liberal phase of neoliberalism, the uh, more beautiful phase of neoliberalism in some cases are uh, missing in your critique. What would you say about that? You know, so uh, we, we, we are, you know, criticizing the right-wing authoritarian versions of neoliberalism, but what are we going to do with uh, the Clinton, the Obama, or other, uh, you know, versions of uh, neoliberalism? So I, I actually think that my my first book on neoliberalism, you know, I... I, I... I do a lot of other things besides think about neoliberalism, but I did write two books on it. So in the first book, Undoing the Demos, I was pretty much focused on the Clinton to Obama version. You know, mm -hmm. it opens with an Obama speech. Mm -hmm. It focuses on, it, there's a reason I call it a stealth revolution because mm -hmm. uh, that, that book is not primarily addressing the rise of, whatever you want to call it, authoritarian populism, hard right social movements and regimes and so forth. It anticipates them. That is what I do in the last chapter. But um, that book and that and the work that comes that that it's based on was um, really written in the early teens uh, and is much more concerned with the gentle side of neoliberalism and was severely criticized mm -hmm. by people who said, oh, but it involves, you know, securitization and fascism and this and that. I mean, look at Turkey, look at Latin America and so forth. Mm -hmm. and I agree, but I was in that book really mm -hmm. trying to think about neoliberalism's warm and sunny face mm -hmm. and what it was doing Mm -hmm. to democracy, society, and the subject. Mm -hmm. I was looking at the kind of profile you gave of yourself at mm -hmm. the beginning of your remarks. Mm -hmm. I'm an academic, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. is who I've become. And, and, and that's really um, quite different than studying the, 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 the rise of the right that emerges from um, uh, neoliberal ground. Okay, that's good. Uh, the, 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 this is I'm asking because this is uh, in, in Europe, in the States, in uh, Turkey. Uh, so uh, you you, re you reminded us, and in your books also we read, you know, Jameson's uh, remark that it's it, it's so easy to. Uh, think about an apocalypse. It's all. It's easy. Zizek says that it's easy to think about zombie attack, uh, the end of the world, the apocalypse, but not the end of capitalism. So the, this is why you know the, the, one of the reasons that I see in the, the, the failure of uh, opposition forces or failure of left to not to Im imagine beyond, uh, beyond uh, you know capitalism and epic. Uh, so uh, I just wanted uh, to give you an opportunity to stress it again. So thank you very much. So uh, the shortened version of our previous uh, question about science and knowledge came. I'm, I'm trying to moderate the questions at the same time. Uh, it's much shorter. Should scientific writing evolve so that people understand without mediation of journalists, etc., which may be open to losses in translation? I, I don't uh, yeah, I mean, it's great when certain scientists can do that, but and I appreciate the question, but I don't think we can put that burden on science. If if you have a geologist, a, geologist, a physicist, um, a, a chemist who um, is studying the particular effects of carbon emissions on the Earth's surface, on streams, on, on, on the atmosphere, um, and that needs to be done inside a scientific language and with certain premises that you and I don't share because we aren't trained. Um, I think that's enormously important. There are plenty of people who can do the translation work. And I wanna make this argument more generally. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel that the, the, the onus on all scholars to to, um, to write immediately in a, in a 
completely popular parlance is wrong. I just don't agree with that demand. I think it's one thing to ask scholars to work in the public interest, to study problems that matter to the world. I, that I'm willing to do. I'm not willing to mandate it because, you know, I just don't, I don't think we can. I think if somebody wants to really go off and think about, um, you know, what Hobbes meant by a particular word or, or um, what was going on in, in a text of Ovid that people think they understood, but now we understand a different way, uh, that's okay. Uh, it's not helping the world, but it's not hurting the world. But I don't think we can ask scholars who are trained to think deeply, carefully, closely about particular kinds of problems to, to immediately speak in a language that, that is available to all of those without that training. Some people are extremely gifted at making the translation themselves. Some mm -hmm. people just really have that capacity. Others of us do not. Others of us um, are not so good at coming out of our particular ways of thinking about things to a common language and a public discourse. And there are others who can do that work. So uh, um, I, I, I don't think we should put that mandate on scientists at all. I think what we do, uh, what, what I have a lot of gratitude, let me put it this way, I'm just enormously grateful to climate scientists because they're, 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 they're figuring out not only what we've done to the world, but the rate and the pace and the depth of what we've done uh, to the world. And in some cases, what some sources of repair might be. And we need that information. And there's plenty of possibilities for mediating between the details of a scientific discourse and um, policy discourse or common understanding. We can do that. That's, you know, we're humans. We know how to make those moves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I do believe that this is also deeply related with uh, the operational uh, ideology. You know, many of the debates and discussions on post-truth assumes that uh, it will be possible for, uh, you know, giving the truth to people and uh, helping them uh, making the right decisions. So uh, there is a there is an information warfare. There is a struggle in the information, yeah. but but information warfare is uh, is a part of that social struggle, of the course. social warfare. So uh, the, 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 yeah, this reminds me, you know, uh, the Marxian formula, as we remember, for, for they do not know what they do, but now it's time to, as Zizek states, to revise the formula, you know. For they do know what they do, but they still do it, you know. So they, yes, this is yes, yes and no. I mean, I I think Bruno Latour is really helpful here. You know, a mm -hmm. lot of people think that, oh, you know, Latour gave us the post-structuralist disruption of science, and he he taught us that science was really fiction, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what Latour taught. And and then people say, oh, and now he's changed his game. Now, now he's for science. And that's not where he is. What Latour did was say science is always constructed out of a network of scientists. It's not simply there on the ground to be picked up by an individual. It's always produced in language and through a network of scientists. And he said, in the 70s and the 80s, that was an important point to make again and again and again and again when science ruled as if it replaced God at, with absolute authority. We needed to be able to challenge that authority. Now, he says, we have a, a world that understands that science is constructed. We're now living in the world that really gets it, that it's produced, that it's linguistically mediated, that it's, that it's not simply true with a capital T. And it's not that he's saying, oh, yes, but in fact it is. I overstated the problem. I don't really agree with my former self. He's saying now we recognize that science and politics are not distinct things, that, that, that politics and science are so imbricated that there will always be 
wars over what is true, and there will always be um, arguments about how to establish politically what we need to do. And, and, and that's a recognition that there's no final, there's no platonic conclusion to mm -hmm. either politics or science. And I, I think that's just enormously important now. Yes, there's cynicism. Yes, there's bad faith. Yes, yes, there's there's deployment of, of, of discourse that, that doesn't even believe itself. That's a problem. That's an issue that is, I think, to some degree separate from what we could call the, the science wars and the climate denialism now, where, where what we have to do is, is, is really take on the fact that we don't just get to say X is true and Y is false, but really have to art make arguments about communities of scholars and communities of knowledge and um, the perils that, that we think we face um, against those who, who say, no, we don't. That's a battle. That's an argument. We have to have that. That's politics. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And that, that battle and struggle is uh, getting more and more violent, you know, the, the, yep. in, in, in many cases, you know. So yes. uh, today, for instance, uh, one of my friends, Jana, a journalist, uh, you know, she was sued by a, a private company uh, for uh, her news, you know, which is yeah. presenting scientific knowledge or, yeah. uh, you know, we, we have many different cases, you know, uh, a, a, again, uh, firms and companies versus journalists, firms and companies versus, uh, you know, scientists and so, and the struggle is... But we're increasing. not going to solve that problem by trying to re-secure truth, by trying to tie it back mm -hmm. to, to nature or to God. Mm -hmm. That, that mm -hmm. game is over. Exactly, exactly. And uh, so... The, the one thing you know uh, is so interesting you know the platonic you know uh conclusions and closures i do also find that so uh important for your discussion on freedom it is also for the case of freedom okay we we, we do not have uh, such uh, conclusions such uh, clear well defined uh definitions of what freedom all is maybe freedom is also about uh, having that openness, openness to interpretation, openness to exploration of yep. different possibilities, yep. being open to uncertainties. You know, the, the nowadays I'm uh, too much uh, involved, uh, a, a bit poisoned by negative dialectics. I'm reading Adorno uh, for days and nights for an article that I'm working on. And one of the lessons that uh, I learned from critical theory uh, is being open all the time, you know, not not having the right answers, not having the formulas, but always having, you know, uh, the urge, the dynamic, and the opportunity of being open to those uh, possibilities, I guess. And uh, this is why, uh, as I have stated in the beginning, uh, reading when the Brown is uh, amazing. Uh, it is uh, so. Uh, inspiring you know I, I think that is the case you know inspiration you know being inspired for further questions uh not answers you know but further questions which is more and more uh valuable for me uh it's uh almost you know uh one hour and 40 minutes uh, it, it, it has been great for me personally uh having you uh you know uh, this intellectual uh, engagement, knowing you, uh, talking to you. Would you like to add anything uh, to our overall discussion? I, I, I wish this uh, would go for hours and hours, but we 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 try to limit it around ninety minutes for uh, you know because this is going to be uh, on uh, the YouTube channel of Cappadocia University, and it will be more accessible that way, and it will be. Uh, translated into Turkish by subtitles in the following weeks. Uh, would you like to make a final comment, maybe uh, your future projects? You talked about them a bit. Uh, that would be really, really nice, uh, that closing. I, I think I'll end instead with just underscoring what you said, drawing on Adorno. Uh, uh, openness to contestation, to rethinking, to others, we don't want to be open to, to 
to worlds, to thoughts that are disruptive, that are difficult. It's a very, it's a very hard thing. It's, it's, it's one of the most challenging practices human beings can have, I think. Uh, it's especially hard now. We are, as you said at the beginning, living not only with multiple crises, political, social, economic, cultural, religious, ecological. For many, I think it's an experience of, of living or fearing that we are living in end times and that those who are our opposition are hastening those end times, whether through autocracy or plunder of the planet. And certainly being open to that is not what I am counseling. And I don't think it's what Adorno is counseling, but continuing to think and continuing to allow the unbidden, the unknown, the unthought, the unwanted, to disrupt and improve our thinking and our action, our connections with others, our political organizing, our work in universities, our work outside universities. It's an enormously difficult practice, but I don't think we have any other choice at this moment because the strategies of the left and the strategies to preserve what remains of intellectual, scholarly, and educational life in universities have not been successful strategies. We're losing. We're losing rapidly. So openness, since we've chosen to end on this note, to new possibilities, new thoughts, new ways of understanding the world new possible connections, new possible alliances is probably our only hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Please. Yeah. Thank you very much. It, it has been a great pleasure and honor. It's uh, my thanks. pleasure as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think uh, that's all for uh, tonight. Thanks uh, to uh, our audience for uh, being with us.